It has been a great morning being able to worship with the saints and to have visitors here from the community. Thank you for being here. We're going to begin our study here in just a moment in Revelation chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one right in front of you in the pew. In Revelation chapter 2, we'll begin our study there. And I know we have visitors from the community. If you're ever interested in a Bible study, be more than happy to study the Word of God with you. It's been an encouragement to me being here today, seeing our brothers and sisters in Christ, our Bible classes. Hopefully we were encouraged in our Bible classes to continue to do the work of God and continue to draw closer to our Father in heaven. Well, I want to go back a number of years, and maybe I've shared this story here, maybe I haven't. Tanya knows all about this story here. Growing up, and I've mentioned this to a a few of you guys, uh, Tanya and I grew up in a really small congregation. When I say a small congregation, uh, it was about two or three rows of, of people right there. That would make up the size of our congregation. We grew up in a church of maybe about 10 people. Uh, give or take a few more people, depending on who was there. Looking back at the congregation that we are a part of, uh, it's very clear that we were binding some things, many things, that should not have been bound uh, as a result of some misunderstanding of the Scriptures. Growing up, I remember every Sunday we used to drive to Hammond, Indiana to worship God. Every Sunday. I know, I'm seeing a lot of weird faces like, what, what were you guys doing? Well, we had at the time one cup, and we couldn't find anyone else who was worshiping in that manner, and so we would drive to Hammond, Indiana every Sunday. You think 9 o'clock, getting here at 9 o'clock is hard? This is a piece of cake. Try driving to another state every week for worship. And I will admit, I had a lot of bitterness because I missed all the great football games in the afternoon because we were on the road driving back. But nonetheless, we would drive there, and we did something interesting And I think that's probably where I picked up a lot of my eating habits with all the snacks and things like that. But after services, we would, I think, go out to eat or something like that. But then we would go to this park. We'd go to this park, and this park had a number of water wells. And we'd we'd have a number of jugs with us, and we would fill up these big water gallon jugs with, with this well water. Why? I have no idea. I'm pretty sure the water was fresh. I hope. I don't know. But I'm pretty sure it was fresh, but just all around the park, they had these wells. And so after lunch or whatever, before we got back on the road, we would fill up these water jugs and then we'd drive back home. And I think we'd worship again, maybe in the evening time, I'm not for sure. Now, I'm going somewhere with this. I want to share this with you because while those wells that we were filling up our jugs, they never ran dry. There was always fresh water. I want to think about where you are. I want you to think about where you are with respect to your walk with Christ. Do you remember when you were converted to Jesus Christ? You remember that? I've been a part of seeing people baptized for the forgiveness of their sins recently. A few weeks ago, we came up here on a Sunday night and uh, a, a man was baptized into Christ. I've seen some of you guys be baptized into Christ, and it's a really special event. It's a very a memorable event. And I've seen tears and the wet hair while people are taking photos and things like that afterwards and people being excited and posting it on Facebook and posting videos of people being baptized. You remember that moment when you were baptized? Now, some of us may have to go a little ways back, maybe 10, 15, 20, 30, or maybe even 40 years. But I want you to think about this. Do you remember the excitement you had when you were born again? You knew you could lay down. You knew that you were right with God when you went to bed that night. And certainly you were zealous and passionate about God and his word. Do you remember that moment where you were excited about studying the word of God? You were interested in hearing what the sermon was going to be that Sunday or the multiple sermons that were going to take place or be preached. And Bible classes, you always had that Bible class material prepared and you couldn't wait to talk to someone, maybe your wife or your children or whoever it was, about the things that you have learned in your personal Bible study. You remember that feeling? There was this great excitement about learning more about God's Word and the Scriptures. And there was no doubt in your mind that you knew that your Father in Heaven loved you beyond a shadow of a doubt. You knew how deep and how great, and although we can never fully realize how great His love is and how deep it is, you knew that your Father in Heaven really loved you. And you could say that your well was full of living water. But now things have begin, begun to change. Maybe now you find yourself feeling like your well has dried up a bit. The water's not flowing as much as it used to. 
the zeal, the passion, the love for God may not be as strong as it was. The title of my lesson is called When the Well Runs Dry. Those wells in Indiana never ran dry. But sometimes our wells, our hearts, our passion, our zeal for God and who he is and what he's done for us at times can begin to run dry. Is that even possible? Does that really happen? Can it even happen to those who have been born again? To those who have tasted the goodness of God? The answer to that is yes. Open up your Bible, please, to Revelation chapter 2. And I want to read to you the first four verses from Revelation chapter 2. There were Christians in the first century who I think we could describe them as having that their wells had become dry, that their zeal and passion for God was no longer there. They had left their first love. And while they were doing many great things, there was something that needed to be corrected. In Revelation 2 and verse 1, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who talks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false. They're going to do them well. They know the truth, and they're abiding in the truth. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Their well had run dry. They had left their first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent, and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent." It is possible for us to leave our first love. It is possible for us to reach a point in our walk with Christ where we feel like our well has kind of run dry. And I want to talk a little bit about that this morning. Do you find yourself, do we find ourselves, because I'm included in this as well, closer to God or farther away from him? Where are we in our walk with our king? Has our lives become, have our lives become so busy that the next big thing that we've lost, looking for the next big thing, that we've lost sight of the biggest thing, which is our Father in heaven. Where are we? Have our wells become dry? Was it a struggle just to get here this morning? I'm not talking about because you may have some sickness or something like that or some type of an emergency. But I'm saying, was it a struggle to, to get your mind prepared that now is the time to gather together to worship God? Was that challenging for you this morning? When we know how important this really is and who we are worshiping, that this isn't about us, this is about him. This is about our king. If we find ourselves struggling, it could be because our well has run dry. Why is it that sometimes our wells run dry? And what can we do about it to make sure that we can change that or to make sure that we don't go down that path anymore? I want to suggest four thoughts, four reasons as to why sometimes our wells may run dry. Maybe one of the problems that some of us may have, if not careful, is that we're just not filled with God's word. That could be why our wells have have run dry. Maybe when we first started our walk with Christ, we had that excitement about studying God's word. And we had that zeal about wanting to learn as much as we could. And we were asking Bible questions. You were texting your preacher or texting your elders at the time or whoever it may have been, trying to get more and more knowledge from God's word. But in the process of time, Maybe we're just no longer filled with God's Word. We don't have as much of an interest in God's Word anymore. And we're not spending that quality time studying His Word. And when we do, we're rushed and we're preoccupied. And I really believe more than ever, this is the reason why many Christians struggle with evangelism. We're talking about evangelism. It's not rocket science, but I believe we we struggle with evangelism because maybe we're just not filling our hearts enough with God's Word. And that could cover a variety of components. We're not reminding ourselves, as Jesus reminded his apostles, look over in John chapter 4, of the work that needed to be done and what Christ has done for us and the fact that he was the one that endured those thorns and the beating and the cross for you and for me and for the entire world. Maybe we're not remembering that enough. In John 4 and verse 34, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say, there are yet four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they're white for harvest. Already he who reaps is received 
receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this saying, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. Maybe that passion for evangelism, that passion of thinking about souls that are outside of Jesus, that are lost, is no longer there. The well has run dry because we simply are not filling our hearts with the word of God. We're not hearing from God as much as we should. And this may be the reason why so many Christians are consumed with fear and with worry because we have failed to forget or failed to remember the great promises that God has for us. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. In Matthew chapter 6, he reminds us that we should not worry. We need to be reminded that we don't have to worry, that God is going to provide. He said in verse number 25, for this reason I say to you, do not be worried. We did a lesson on this. We talked about this, but we need to hear this on a constant basis. Do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Maybe this is why sometimes we can find that our well has run dry to some extent. Because we're not focusing as much on God's word and the great promises that he has given us. Because our minds are not focused that he has to be our number one priority, which we are going to be reminded of as we study from his word. As your will run dry, if it has, this may be one reason. This may be the reason why we don't always have the same adoration for our Father in heaven. And the same mindset of praising him with all of our hearts. Because we have forgotten who it is that he is, the power that he has, the fact that he is holy, and the fact that he loves us. Our well may be somewhat dry because we have simply just failed to seek after the good part. In Luke chapter 10, the good part in Luke chapter 10 is what Jesus reminded both Martha and Mary in Luke chapter 10 and verse number 38 when he went to their house. In Luke chapter 10, he entered a village and went into the house of a woman named Martha in verse number 38, and she welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word, but Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care? Now my sister has left me to do all the serving alone, then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to, her, said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and bothered about so many things. But only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. It could be that sometimes our wells have dried up, so to speak, that our hearts are not where they need to be because we have not filled our hearts as much as we should with God's word. I think that's sometimes why some Christians may struggle. Maybe, maybe some of us are struggling at this very moment, and that could be part of it. Here's another reason as to why sometimes our wells may run dry. We're living in sin. You know, if we're living in sin, your well is going to run dry. This is often going to be the byproduct of the first reason When our hearts aren't filled with God's word, we're not going to redeem the time. We're not going to have the proper perspective of how we view things in life the way that we should view things. The darkness is going to become more and more appealing to us. In Ephesians chapter 5, remember what Paul said. He was writing to people, the saints in Ephesus. He was writing to them about who they were and what they had learned in Christ in chapter 4. Then in verse number 11 of Ephesians chapter 5, remember he said, Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. It could be that our wells are dry because we're not exposing sin, but rather we're engaging in these acts. We're practicing these things, and they have become a habit for us. Do not participate in these unfruitful deeds. It's disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine in you. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. If we're walking in sin, living a life of sin, sin is going to strip us of our zeal, of our passion, and our focus upon God. And that's exactly what the devil wants to happen. That's exactly what he wants. 
And we can look back in the Old Testament and we can see that it will work. He will get his way if that's the path that we decide to take. The Israelites' wells, they often ran dry because they engaged in sexual immorality. And they complained more than being content because they went after idols instead of going after the true and living God. Now, their wells didn't dry up overnight. It didn't just happen just like that. But it was a slow and steady decline. Before they knew it, they were far away from God. They couldn't even probably recognize who they were. God would eventually lead them into captivity. He would eventually lead them into captivity to to wake them up, to get them to see what happened. Let me show you what happened. And sometimes that has to happen even for us. That sometimes we may have to hit rock bottom to clearly look inside our wells to see maybe that they are empty. And that there's some things that we need to work on and things that we need to get out. Where are we? Has our well dried up? Where are we with our walk with God? Is sin the problem as the reason why our wells may be dried up? When we get ensnared with sin, our wells will become really muddy and nasty. And Peter spoke about that in 2 Peter chapter 2. Remember as he warned the saints about false teachers and those who would try to get them to return? In 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter reminded them in verse number 20, he said, For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness and having known it, to turn away from the holy commandment handed unto them. It has happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. Some of those individuals had turned away from the true and living God. And now they have found themselves in a worse situation. And we have to make sure that we don't find ourselves in that situation. But sin will sometimes do this. Sin has a way of, of causing us to, to, to have our wells to run dry. That could be a reason why maybe some of us are struggling at this very moment. Another reason as to why our wells may run dry is it could be just because of other people. Have you ever experienced this before? There is a great prophet in the Old Testament, Elijah. And I want you to turn over to 1 Kings chapter 19. Elijah, I love the story of Elijah. This man was a man on on fire for the Lord. He was zealous and he did the work of God confidently and he had the boldness to stand before the false prophets and before uh, the wicked king. And yet what we find in 1 Kings chapter 19 is that Ahab and Jezebel would bring up much discouragement, particularly Jezebel, to this great man. In 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 1, the Bible says, Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. You're going to be dead in about 24 hours, Elijah. And he was afraid and arose and ran for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. This man hit a rough spot, a rough patch, I think you could say maybe that his, that his well, so to speak, may have been a little dry. Certainly he was tired, and certainly he would have been frustrated. And while he had these great spiritual highs in his life, he had, he had reached a point where he was frustrated. And one person, this circumstance, was, a, was able to cause him to hit a dry spell. And Jezebel had a negative effect upon him, and he wanted to die. Discouragement set in. Has this ever happened to you? Have others around you caused your well to maybe run dry? It happened to Elijah. Remember Moses? Even godly people caused his well to run a little bit dry because they complained so much. And Moses got so frustrated with the people of God. What about Job and his friends? While his friends had good intentions, eventually they became a nuisance for Job. 
he was frustrated with a variety of for a variety of reasons. It could be sometimes that people may be the reason other people, maybe it's friends, maybe it's even family members that have caused us maybe to, to, to lead us away from God instead of drawing even closer to him or have discouraged us in some shape or manner. Maybe they have hurt us in some shape or manner. Maybe our spouse has disappointed us so much that we feel like giving up. Sometimes members or Christians can, can get to the point where they feel like that's where they are with their well. Their well has run dry. Maybe that's a reason why some of us may be struggling. Let me give you one more. Maybe we're disappointed with God. Now, this may be hard to fathom. And sometimes it's even hard to even say. Many times, members may not always vocalize their feelings. But have you ever been disappointed with God? You don't have to raise your hand or anything like that. Do you feel disappointed with God at this very moment? There are Christians, not just here, but all around the world, who I think are silently hurting in the pews. And they may not share it with their with their preacher or their shepherds or maybe even with their spouse sometimes, but sometimes there are people who are just hurting. And maybe they have become disappointed. Have you been disappointed with God in the way that he's answered your prayers or maybe in the way that he hasn't answered your prayers? Do you ever feel like God just doesn't care? We may not always like to admit this, but I think many times, I think sometimes Christians feel this way. In Mark chapter 4, remember when the disciples were going to cross the sea In Mark chapter 4, they said something very interesting to Jesus. You would think that with what they knew about him, that this wouldn't be something that they would utter or even think. In Matthew chapter, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 4, and verse number 35, on that day when evening came, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, listen, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? I mean, come on, why would they even say that? Of course he did. He was with them. He told them what was going to happen. And yet that, that crept into their mind. Do you not care that we're perishing in your sleep here? Do you not care that we're perishing? I think sometimes we can struggle with that same mindset as well. Lord, do you really care? Do you care about me? Do you care about what I am going through? Do you see the dilemma that I'm in? You see my health. Do you see my health declining? You see my marriage. You see the situation that we're in. Do you not even care? Sometimes we may feel like God doesn't care. That he's unconcerned about my situation. And you know what will happen if not careful? When this happens, when this begins to creep into our hearts, our well of contentment is going to start to run dry. Our well of worship and praise is not going to be where it needs to be. And our faith can also begin to run dry as well. These are some reasons, and I'm sure there are other reasons that I could probably list up there. But let me ask you, where are you today? Where are you this morning with your walk with Christ? with your faith in God, as your well begin to run dry. If you see yourself here, then I want to give you some encouragement because there are some things that we need to do and we need to hold on to. Number one, we're going to have to flood our, uh, flood our hearts with God's word. First and foremost, we're going to have to flood our hearts with the word of God. Well, here's what that means. We've got to stay connected to him. We've got to stay connected to him and his word because as soon as we walk away, our water levels will decrease. It's kind of like a Bluetooth device. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? The Bluetooth device, if you have your earphones and you're working out, as long as that Bluetooth device is close to that phone, everything is perfect. Everything is good. The connection is strong. But as soon as you step away from where that source of power is, the connection is not going to be there. It gets frustrating. And eventually there just won't be any connection. But we've got to stay connected to the source of our power and strength. We've got to remain with him, and we need to hear from our Father every day. We need to taste the Word of God like we're tasting it for the very first time. There is nothing wrong with the Word of God. 
The Bible is not boring. The Bible, the stories are not kind of boring or stale. There's nothing wrong with the Word of God. It's our hearts that's wrong. We start to view the Bible that way. It's our hearts. It's not the Word of God. There's nothing wrong with God's Word. And we need to be filled again, filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to listen to the words of the Holy Spirit and be under the influence of what He has shown us and taught us in His words. In Ephesians 5 and verse 18, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. We need to enjoy the good portion as Jesus told Martha. You're worried and bothered about too many things. Enjoy what I've given you. We need to enjoy the good part, the good portion again. Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19, you know what helped him to get back on track? Yeah, he needed some food and he needed to rest, but he needed to hear from God. And that's exactly what God did. Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? But he needed to hear from God. Elijah needed to be reminded in 1 Kings chapter 19 about his purpose. And he needed to be reminded to keep the proper perspective. You have work to do, Elijah. And you're not the only one serving God. He needed to hear from God. And brothers and sisters, we need to hear from God too. It's on us to open up our Bibles. And I know we say that a lot. We need to read our Bibles. Yes, we do. We need to read and stay connected more than ever. And I said this in my Bible class. I wrote it in the bulletin. If you haven't read the bulletin, and I'm going to say it again. In Luke chapter 19 and verse number 47 and 48. Look at Luke chapter 19, verse 47 and 48. And I've got to ask myself, is this me? Would this be me? In Luke 19 and verse number 47 and 48, this is part of our Bible reading too. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the leading men among the people were trying to destroy him. I want you to notice what he said in verse 18 where Luke recorded and they could not find anything that they might do for all the people were hanging on to every word he said hanging on to every word he said is that the way that I look at the word of God I want to know every word Jesus said I want to hear from Jesus every day I want to open up the Bible and, and draw closer to him and learn more about his word and the great promises that he's given me is that my mindset if it's not, then that's what we need to do. That's how we're going to fill up our wells again. We need to hear, hear from God and hide the word of God in our heart. You see, that's going to help us with the second problem that often happens where we allow sin to get in the way. We need to first uh, flood our hearts with God's word, and then we've got to make provisions to avoid the sin. We've got to make provisions to avoid sin at all cost. No matter what the situation may be, we must avoid sin. We have to f- flee from the snares of the devil. And we're going to have to take radical steps in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 28 and 29. If you truly want your well to be filled and to draw closer to your Father in heaven and to increase in your faith and your walk with God, then we're going to have to take extreme measures. That's what Jesus is telling us in his word. I don't know we read this a lot, but we really got to buy into it and actually do it. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. You can fill in the blank with a variety of other things that we need to do there or that that could apply there, not just with uh, adultery in our heart. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. That's how serious this really is. And that's the drastic measure that we must take and when we start getting that sin out of our lives watch and see how your well is going to be filled again leave no idol standing clean everything out but until you really buy into this it won't work we got to truly believe what jesus is telling us here and if we find ourselves that our wells are dry then we need to fill up our hearts with god's word and we need to make the necessary provision to get rid of sin we're also going to have to do something else. It may require us also avoiding certain people, changing up some things in our environment. Avoid people who are bringing you down. Young people need to learn this, and, and not just young people, <laughs> but it's, it's for all of us. We all, need to, we all need to believe this and buy into this. You know, I often think about for years I preach from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Where's the verse here? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where it talks about how Bad morals corrupt good manners. That's not just for young people. That's for everybody. That's for me, and that's for you. 
And that's something we need to hold on to. And if, the, if it's true, we need to make sure that we make the necessary changes in our lives. And that may mean avoiding certain people. Avoid those people who are bringing you down. While we are to live in the world, we're not to be a part of the world. So be careful who you surround yourself with. Be careful how much stock you put into the words of others. Elijah listened too much to Jezebel. He saw the power of God in chapter 18. He saw what God could do. But he listened too long to this woman named Jezebel. So be careful who you listen to. And be careful who you surround yourself with. Surround yourself with brethren that will help you to attain the goal of heaven. And I recognize that some relationships are more permanent than others, like marriage. And you can't necessarily just leave your spouse. But at the same time, even if your spouse is not concerned about doing right, as hard as it is, we strive to do good. We do the right thing. That's who we are called to be. No matter what the situation is, we strive to live holy. And that may mean that we're going to have to avoid some people. If people are are causing your well to run dry, you don't need them. You need to be around people who are going to help you get closer to your Father in heaven. And maybe most importantly, all of these are important. We need to make sure that we know that God really does love you and me. This coincides with the point of being disappointed with God. We need to know that God really does love us. His silence, when we feel like he's not answering our prayers in the way that we think he should, does not mean that he is unconcerned about us. Wilson Adams, in one of his books, Wilson Adams is a gospel preacher, he said this, God may not calm your storm immediately. Sometimes he may allow the storm to rage longer than you prefer. If you must abandon ship, your plans... Abandon your plans, but don't abandon him. God will always throw you a lifeline. Maybe the lifeline of prayer or a calming promise of scripture or the helping hand of a brother or sister who's been exactly where you are. The apostles cried out to Jesus in Mark 4, and we're going to have to do the same. We're going to have to know that our Father in heaven, he really does care about you and me. He cares about our situation, and he sees what we go through in this life. And because he loves us, we, therefore, are going to have to continue to walk by faith. We're going, to have to, we're going to have to stay with him. Our faith has to stand for something. Our faith has to stand for something. We can't just merely talk about it, but we're going to have to stand. Even when it gets challenging, we must stand. And when we do, watch how our well, your well, will be filled again. We need to know that God really does love us. We're reminded of that at the Lord's Supper. He loves us. And he's demonstrated how much he loves us by sending his son to die on the cross for my sins and for your sins. We are complete in him. Let's be sure that we stay with him. So I will leave you with this. Is your well dry? Have you left your first love? The saints in Revelation, they left their first love. Are you not as connected as you need to be with your father in heaven? Is worship not as appealing as it first was when you were first converted? We get an opportunity to sing praises to God, to shout out our praises to God. And yet it's sad that sometimes we'll stand or we'll sit and we won't say a word to our Father. We won't sing any praises to God. Have we got to that point where that zeal and that passion is no longer there? Is sleeping in more appealing than gathering with the saints? I know many of us may be tired, but so was Jesus. And he was tired when he took his cross. He was tired when they beat him. And he was tired when he was on the cross. And yet he finished what he said he was going to do. And we follow the example of our Savior. If we have have left our first love, if our well is dry, then we need to repent. That's what Jesus told the saints in Ephesus. Repent. That's the mindset that we need to have. We need to return to him. Walk with him. And see what he will do for us. God is with us. And let's appreciate who we are in him. And let's make sure that our wells are always filled by remaining connected to him. Maybe you haven't even started your journey walking with Christ. Maybe you're not even a disciple of Jesus Christ. We want to help you. We want to study with you. We want you to be saved because Christ died for you as well. And if you're interested in a Bible study, we would love to study the word of God with you. If you're ready to become a Christian right here, right now, you're ready to turn away from sin, you're ready to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, 
We would love to help you with that at this time. We're ready if you are ready. If you're subject to the invitation, come now as we stand and as we sing.